Hey, good morning. Are you Hello. lagging? You're lagging there a lot. Yeah, I, I, I feel like I need a new computer. It's like, like if my computer can't support video chat, I think that's a bit of a. Well, it's not like I'm running any like servers on this computer. It's literally just <laughs> video chat. It's uh, a MacBook, isn't it? It's a MacBook. So I don't know. The hypothesis is that it could be that. I'm plugged into two monitors and it can't handle that. Although I, I doubt that highly. It's, an, it's not an M1, right? It's not. It's it's, it's a regular one, the Intel one. I I still doubt that's the case. Hmm. Like Favorite. so, I'm connected to two displays. In a sec. Um, how do I tell what resolution this is on? What your camera or no your monitor? My, my monitor. Are you are you on uh Mac? Yeah, I'm on Mac. So if you go to uh displays. Yeah. Um it should just show up. Well it shows up on my second monitor, but it's not showing up on my main display. And by main display are you talking about like literally the laptop display? Well, so I have my laptop like closed. So it's like connected. So it's not showing on my laptop, but it's showing on my monitor on behalf of my laptop. Oh, okay. Okay. If I, oh, maybe this is why it's on 2560 by 1440. So that's about like 4K. Maybe 4K is the issue. All right. I'm going to maybe disappear for a bit. Yep. Well, you disappeared. Um, oh. <laughs> oh, what? Uh, no, but am I back? No. Oh. Yes, but uh, uh, it's kind of still pretty wow. laggy. I'm getting, I'm getting beach ball. Yeah. Uh, let me let me read out, read out. I guess. Uh, one second. Sure. Does anybody have edit access to the meeting notes? I can check to see if I do. No. Nope. I'll check with Ops real quick, see if there's somebody around who can do that. Yeah, yep. Yeah. All right, is this a little bit better? No, kind of the same. Mm, about the same. Yeah, maybe I just ask for, <laughs> on, let me ask for your laptop. <laughs> well, what laptop are you even? Do you even have? Is it the? It's like this is a Mac that's from a couple of years ago, but it shouldn't be like. It's yeah, a yeah. two point three non... gigahertz i nine. Oh well, I don't know. I like that should be like. You should be able to do video conferencing on a, yeah, on a laptop yeah, yeah. that's like. Um, Oh, now now you're back. Yeah, it's better now, actually. Yeah, it's just randomly, just, just started, like... Or not. But, so, it, it, it seems to go back and forth. Uh, <laughs> um, cool. Uh, so, uh, since we're already, like, I think, four minutes over, so now that this, this meeting is, is now part of uh, the OpenSSF, uh, we'll do the whole spiel. So... Um, just as a reminder, this meeting uh, is being um, recorded. It'll be uploaded to LFX uh, shortly after um, the end of the meeting. And your participation in this meeting is an agreement to abide by the OpenSF Code of Conduct. And then also um, the meeting notes have uh, uh, information on the Code of Conduct as well as the, the OpenSSF antitrust policy. Um, we don't need to go into the, the whole what the antitrust policy is outside of just, hey, uh, there are many people who will be joining this group who might be competitors and then blah, blah, blah. And that anything we are doing here is, is, is in, um, you know, the sake of common goals and not to, you know, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, not for world domination. Yes. Uh, so I still don't have edit access. So 
also it's acting a little strange for me. But um, for folks who do maybe have edit access, uh, feel free to 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 put your attendance in the meeting notes. So this is the first um, one of these. Uh, and oh, uh, Ben. Yeah, it looks like the permissions got set to anyone with the link. So you should if oh. you refresh, huh. you should be able to. Maybe I just need to click the link again. No, it still says I need, I don't have edit access. Weird. Uh, I yes, don't think, wait. Same for me. Yeah. Oh, it was, so sometimes, uh, can you, so if you have edit access, so you should be able to share the link with edit access. Can you uh, just share the link? Because I wonder if it's yeah. just set to the link itself is, you know. Um, yeah, I just dropped it in the chat. Okay, cool. Let's see. Yeah, now that, wait. No. Weird. No, that's weird. Yeah, that's not working. Yeah, it's not working. Right again, I just changed it. Okay. Yeah, now it's working. Um okay. Cool. Uh so um feel free to put your, your attendance in the meeting now. Um and uh, get started. Um Cool. Just as a reminder to folks, this is the you know Guac maintainers meeting. So this is where you know the folks who are are part of the uh, who are the maintainers who are, it's mostly going to be focused on um, you know big open issues and that sort of stuff and uh, uh, and things like that. Okay. I'm still having permission issues, but I'm, I'm, I'll oh, figure that out. Yeah, same. I think it's well. Weird. Let's just keep moving. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I was like mentally skipping the table because I thought the attendees list was not there. And it's just like funny how the brain ignores certain things. Yep. Okay. Um, I guess, I guess. Uh, are there any issues open that we want to highlight? Uh, and then if if not, I think if we have some time, we can continue the discussion on on the identifier stuff. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, before getting to that, I, I do think uh, th there's somebody <laughs> new to to the this meeting that maybe wants to oh. inter introduce themselves first. Um. Well, I assume you're talking about me, Mike. Oh no, there's also somebody okay. from uh uh the um and. I apologize. I don't know how to pronounce your your, your name uh, from the European Organization for Nuclear Research. That will be Sardin, if you can see me. Hello. Hi, this is Fadis. Um, I think it's the first time I joined this uh, session for uh, work. And uh, basically, I want to uh, see what's happening. I am uh, basically into Linux and open source for almost, uh, well, three decades plus by now. Uh, and um, of course, I want to see what's happening and, um, and how we can either uh, take or give. And that's it. And that will be off camera for the rest of the of the of this round. All right. Cool. Yep. Take care. Yeah. yeah also, um, just so you know, we have two sets of openness as meetings. Uh, we have a community one, which is usually like presentations and like updates uh, that happens on every th Thursday, I believe. Uh, next one being 20th of June. Uh, and then this one is like a weekly one that we, we discuss issues. Um, and we also have right now office hours on uh, certain Fridays, which are in the Quark.sh uh, website. Um, so yeah. I think depending on depending on which which meets your purpose, um, feel free to take a look at the other meetings as well. Uh, um, so there is one PR that just fixes the issues with the linter and static analysis and stuff that's open. Uh, I think Mihai already approved it, so there's one more approval to fix the main branch. And then I, I think after that, I was thinking, like, um, should we go ahead and do a release? Or are any any objections against that? Uh, 
Um, uh, maybe I'm jumping ahead of myself. Uh, is this a is this also a discussion for version number or or is or is this just a discussion of should we cut a release here before or anything later? I think in terms of version number, I I'll have to double check. This I think pagination was added after this. So there's a bunch of, there's been GraphQL changes. So either way we'll have to change it to, you know, 0 0.7 in terms okay. of the release. Uh but this wouldn't be like a one point oh so Oh no, no, no. This is an oh, incremental okay. release. Yeah, yeah. No. This is yeah, an okay. incremental release. Uh, there's been uh like the uh Guac Collect now also has OSV added to it, and the OSV certifier. So this way it follows the same pipeline as the rest of the you know rest of the collectors and whatever else. So you can still you can go via the the pub sub and the blob store and everything. The proper mechanism you want to go through. So some of that stuff like you can publish it out, then people can start using it. So that's the main reason. And then you add all the different changes to the the, the pagination and everything else. So any objections? I can I can take that action and. Uh, you know, do do the testing. We need to do some testing. Make sure every, none of the demos break, all that kind of stuff, and and get a release out. Yeah, we have the 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 release um, process much then now, so you can you can be a uh, pilot tester. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I can do that. Oh yeah, Jeff. Should <clears throat> should we do um? Take a look and at the uh, exposed client operations, and um, like expose, like preemptively expose more, or should we just expose as needed? Oh, you, you mean? Oh, you... What do you mean? What the... So the generated client, the generated Go client, doesn't have every oper every mutation exposed. Um, so for those that want to build integrations with walk using that go client, like there might be, you know, for, for, for stuff that's used in walk itself, like in the, in the actual CLIs, everything's there, obviously, but there's, there's stuff that's not there. Um, and it might be nice to have all that in a release. Uh, I don't know if we should just try to do everything or if we should just, you know, look and see if there's any of that. But I don't know how we would go <laughs> go about deciding which ones should be exposed, which ones shouldn't, if we don't do all all, or if we should just continue to kind of expose things as as they're requested. Or does this need to be like a separate uh, a separate uh, repo? <laughs> well, because you know theoretically, like this client is for the the code inside the repo, right? And should we have a Separate repo that does a get, you know, does a just pulls the API and generates everything for for integrations. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I guess I guess we can kind of think about this as like if we think it is a um something that probably is a has a good interface as a consumer, then kind of like access like a, a another report. But I, I don't think we have a need to kind of split that up yet. Uh, I think maybe uh, I, I think the question is like, do we I feel like we should keep it up to date. If there's a cost to keep it up to date, but it doesn't align with the releases, then you know, um, is that something that we want to guarantee maintenance of? So it's just exposing out the existing functionality, right? So it's pretty simple to do. So uh, maybe I'm not sure if you guys. Uh, if you know what this part is. So it's, it's under the uh, client's op operations, right? We have the GraphQL there. And I think usually it's been me, hi, and Jeff approving some of these things. I've been making some changes, but basically it's all that, all these operations here, right? Exposing out the queries. Right now we have ingestion exposed, 
we don't have some other queries exposed, like, you know, has source set. You can't query via the client the has source set if you wanted to, right? It's it's just exposing it out. Both the, you can, you know, the both the paginated and the non-paginated query, you can just expose both of them and then people can use what they want to. That's all it is. So it, it should be fairly straightforward to do. So, I mean, I, I'm in favor of just doing it. And it, and if it's, it's a, you know, it's like a you know, 10, 20 minute work to do that, I think. And I can get I can get a PR out before the release, if if that's something. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not it's not a blocker to get a release. Does that make sense, Brennan? Yeah. I I guess. Was there something else you were thinking about? No, I guess I'm thinking about it in terms of like a, a process wise, right? If you implement a feature in GraphQL, then you have to kind of like check out these boxes, um, so that. We don't end up yeah. with, with a situation where like, oh yeah, I should forgot to add a client for this. Correct. Yeah, um, I think it should be part of the process. So if you add anything new, we should make it mandatory. Like you expose it via the client. Yeah. So is there anything, so in terms of this process, where should we encode this or should, is this like worth discussing right now or, because it, it, it would make sense to me in my head, but I, I don't know specifically how would this look like. I think ideally there's some automation around it, um, but. Could we make it as part of that checkbox? You know, how we have in our, in our PRs, we have like a checkbox that says, oh, you know, the code is generated. You can also put a check mark there saying like, hey, if it's a new GraphQL operation, then make sure that's exposed via the client also. Yeah, that should be simple to do. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm good with a checkbox. And then I think if we can open up an issue to see whether someone can has an idea on how to automate that, I think that would be better. Any other PRs that need to be merged in before this? Just looking at the PR list, I don't see anything. There is there well. is a issue that is listed as um, blocking. How is there? Um, wait, hold on, my computer is just not working very well. Um, update docs to reflect new Quark One query non recursive implementation. Um, What's the number? Uh, sixteen ninety three. Oh, I didn't. We, we didn't watch this yet, so it's fine. Um, that's not an issue. Oh, six. Yeah, sixteen ninety two was the actual PR, right? That's the recursive. Yeah. Okay. That that one's not much yet, so I think it's fine. Um, I think it has some issues. Yeah. Yeah, I think I just rebase it. I didn't, I didn't clean it up. So uh, I'll take the label off that. Uh, Nineteen thirty-three is not really a blocker, but I think I'll have to work on resolving that uh, you know, based on a comment that uh, Brennan made. This is basically changing it so that. Um, all the, uh, okay, I can look in the chat here, but all the, all the parsers, so XPDX and Cyclone DX parsers will always be at a version level, package version level, and never at the name level. 
So whenever we're checking dependencies, it's always going to be at the version level. And if the version is not specified, it's going to be an empty, empty string. So I think this is actually actually a pretty significant change, right? Like yes. Mm -hmm. um, but so technically, what's happening right now is if you look at the code, right? Like that helper function, it even though it maps it to. Uh, let me see. So the helper function is checking to see if the if the dependent package coming in specifies if either it's if it's not if it's nil if it's not nil or if it's not empty and the version i think we're uh, let me look at it again it's been a while since i looked at this I mean, it's pointing to files don't have versions, so it's always just pointing to to the package name and saying all versions, right? But does that even make well, a difference? Files. But even if something doesn't have a version, there's still a version node. Right. The empty version node, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah and, exactly. And I think that's what we want to always connect to, um, because otherwise, it's a lot more difficult to reason about. Um, and this ties into our, our, our conversation from last time as well. I'm good with that, actually. Yeah, I think that works. Um, that we we don't have to, it makes it easier. We don't have to actually change the format of it. Um, it. It makes the dependency traversal a lot cleaner, right? Because you don't have to go back up to the the name node and version about the version range ever. Yeah. Right. It's always because based on all the things that we have currently, XPDX and Cyclone DX will not specify a version range. It'll specify a specific version for its dependencies. And same with the depths.dev collector. It resolves it to a version and not a version range. Where do we get version ranges input then? We don't at all. Oh. I, I thought I thought it's it's annotated in the is dependency node. It's just not. We, we if you point to a version, it's not used. Like we have that information, right? And we were probably getting it at some point, unless we remove it. That. No. Yeah. So it's still there, right? So if if yeah. something does specify a version range, you know, we have a place of we have a place to uh, uh, drop it in. Right. So I, I'm not saying we remove the functionality of being able to being for is dependency to be able to be at the package name level. I think we keep that. I'm just saying that that for the parsers themselves, XPDX and Cyclone DX, if an SBOM is coming, right? If you're ingesting an SBOM, it'll always be at a version level. It'll never be at a version range. What if the input um S bombs uses a version range. What do you mean by that? The so saying like well, all these versions. Um, in in SPDX you can't do that today. I don't know about Cyclone DX. You can't put like a, a sember in the version info. Well, technically, you could put a, yeah. Well, technically, you could put anything in the version, the version field. <laughs> um, I mean, if you're not supposed to, then it, then it's fine. We don't have to try to handle that. I, I don't think it's, it's at least the way that SPDI describes it, I don't, don't think it's supposed to be a range. Uh -huh. Let yeah, so I think again. Cyclone Cyclone DX. I think it's also it's a version and not a version range based on the spec.
so what with this PR that you're, you're, you're talking about, we would just eliminate all this dependency for pointing to names, right? Then right. we can deprecate that. That if we if we need to, I'm not sure if it ever if we ever need to use it again. I don't know. Like, I'm not removing the functionality from the database, or you know, like the, being able to do that. What this, yeah, but basically what this does is that now everything is at a version level and we, that just makes everything, that makes the, the dependency traversal a lot simpler because we're unnecessarily tying it to a version range when it's never going to be a version range. So even if like, you know, for example, the helper function, right, that I, I'm removing, if the version, if it's, if the version is specified, it's going to be a, a version <laughs> at the end of the day, it's not going to be uh, uh sorry if the version is actually let me double check that i think the version is never going to be empty bring that up i closed it where'd it go i think we, this, this is the chat we had in slack i just can't find it now in slack where I, where the hell did i put that conversation i i think it's fine oh, here right? it is. because i i think what marco was saying is that even if the virtual image is empty then we treat it as a version of the empty version which kind of almost like access the name node but it's pointing to a version node right so, so it, th it's not yeah sorry go ahead um i was just gonna say for for this to be like useful i think we should document it um like in the in the GraphQL schema, um, but then I guess we also need to remember that if this ever changes, if we start ingesting version ranges from somewhere, then we would have to update that documentation. I think my my uh, my opinion on this is that. Um, having the information could be part of the metadata, but I, I think the, what we're doing now is just saying that this should always point to a concrete, um, concrete definition, not, not, not saying that it is a version, but pointing to a concrete definition is like. I rather not have like deprecate the other functionality. Um, there is like a a very very good reason because I think it costs us a little bit more pain than 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 it has been helpful in the past. I think, um, if, to rephrase that, I think like the current proposal seems good. And I think if we want to add it in, we probably, um, to add it back in, I think we probably want to think a lot, a lot harder, um, and be more resistant to that because I, I think it's, um, I don't think we found a, a good enough use case to have that for its dependency. Yeah, so I'm just checking here. Uh, the version is never going to be nil. Right? It's always going to be an empty string. Based on how we have it. So yeah, in that case, I think we just map it to the the empty string version version node. I have a bias here as well because like this brings us to the identifier proposal that we we want to talk about. So so uh do we want to merge this or should I wait? I, I think this is not 
critical or something. We can wait to merge this after I can do a release today, or do we want to merge this in first and then do a release? Uh, let me take a quick look. Um... I'm not sure the change, you know, the change you're asking about with files. I'm not sure how much, how, how long that's going to take. No, no, I, I think with, with what Marco said, that change isn't necessary. Oh, it's not? Because okay. what I believe, um, I think the question is, let me see, hold on. Well, is it, is it, well, at the time. I look into the, the, the test right now to see what the, our definition is for. Oh yeah, I guess it's always it's always empty version. Yeah. Yeah. For the files, is there a shot to fix uh, or the you know just uh, the digest going to be captured? I was that's what I was going to check based on the pearl. Based on the pearl we generate, would that be captured captured as a version? So, so sorry. So, uh, so based on based on the pearl that we generate, right? We generate guac generic file, SHA two fifty six. Yeah. Right? How is how is our parser or how is the you know the pearl getting it's this, parsed? It's this one, and then it goes into the generic pearl, um, uh, pearl to pearl to package. Um, this one which uses the it goes from here to here um all right yeah so from there I was, that's what i was going to ask is that being outputted as the empty version or a, the shots of 256 being captured as a version so what do we want uh, so based on pearl combat it it always um it calls the pearl helper in that file, mm -hmm. um, and that says that it's going to take the address of the version, uh, which is a string. So no matter what, it's always going to be populated. 
Right, Sorry, no, that's fine. The package, the package. Um, the no, but should it be SHA two fifty six or should it be an empty string? That's my question. Oh, okay. Mm. So I think the reason, one of the reasons that we chose to do that was that if we did it as a version, it would create like a star, a massive mm -hmm. star node, right? Mm -hmm. And then we had ingestion problems then. Okay. Um, so this so isn't the, way... the case anymore, right? Well, if someone went to the farm node and called neighbors, <laughs> they would have a bad time. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll check this offline. That's fine. Um, I guess I'm, I'm curious to 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 see whether other folks have thoughts on that, right? Like what the structure of a file package should be, or whether it should exist at all. We're not using it currently for anything. Like we ignore files. Go on. We ignore anything guac generated, at least for now. But like, what are we going to use the files for? Like, is there if there's a use case? Then yeah. But well, I think that's a use case on binaries, right? Like I, I think we. We want to say like, okay, yeah, uh, this is binary. This binary can then be linked to, like the the work that Marco did, uh, a while back. Like this binary can be linked to another S bomb, based on the hash. But maybe you get, hmm. like you get them from south side, don't you? Don't get that today from S forms, but maybe those should be treated as artifacts. So we should never like S forms should. A has S form should have a list of files. But we have nothing to say. That's a dependency on the package to a file today. Yeah. So I mean, in that case, the current structure is fine then, right? Because we have a package to artifact, and we have an occurrence mapping between the two. Anyways, um, okay, so I guess just to, for the sake of time, I think we want to discuss some of the identifier stuff too, right? So let's just move on. Um, I'll check to see how the file is being, you know, the, the file, the Perl that we generate for files, how is that being parsed? I'm pretty sure it's not capturing the, the digest as a version. And if it's not, I think we want to keep it that way so that we don't run into star graphs, correct? Is everyone in agreement for that? Hmm. Or we can wait to merge this one in. <laughs> we can talk about it. It's fine. 
I'm okay. trying to imagine a world where, where we, 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 how do we stop people from exposing a star graph? <laughs> Alright, so we'll, 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 we'll uh, skip this one, we'll skip this PR for this, for this release. It's fine. Okay. So we'll just make, we'll make changes, we'll expose out the queries on the client side, and then get a PR out. I'll get a release out probably by the end of the day. All right. That's everything from my side. Uh, so we can talk about the, the identifier stuff. So I think since we are on this topic, may, maybe and it's fresh in your mind, um, where we relates to identifiers, I don't think we talked about, about files at all, right? So like, um, We talked about packages and how to identify them. We haven't talked about files and how to identify them and how we use files today. Um, I guess our, our files packages. Let me. Yeah, I was going to ask. About... A... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, I, I spent a little bit of time on the weekend thinking about the method of like sets for identifying and uh, I I realized that it would work, but we do lose the hierarchical nature of of like the pearls. Like there's no hierarchy, it's just essentially we explode any identifier into a set of uh, properties and then each artifact is identified by uh, this set of properties rather than uh, rather than by a hierarchical series of like a namespaces. I think this is relevant to what you're asking, Brandon, because uh, since we lose the hierarchy, one would be tempted to say, well, a file could be exploded into a set of like base names, right? Uh, but uh, that needs to be a hierarchical like uh, arrangement. I was I was thinking through an example of like for example having say uh, two packages, one of them being GitHub slash TensorFlow slash uh, Python, and the other one being GitHub slash Python slash TensorFlow. Uh, in this case, I know that this is a this is a URL, but uh, in this case, you are okay by exploding it into property because you're essentially say hosting location it's one property. Uh, repo name or organization is one property, and then repo name is another property. And since you cannot swap them around, you you still somehow maintain the hierarchy. Uh, with files, which are essentially not uh, strictly hierarchical, or well, or rather they're strictly hierarchical, but they're not like named hierarchies. Uh, the namespace are namespaces are like completely arbitrary. Then we run into the into the problem of not being able to like handle it. Uh, natively in this model, or at least not without like thinking about it a little bit better. I would argue that we want to think about files in the same way that we think about packages, mostly because uh, I would say that both of them fall within the notion of artifacts, and really just the way that we locate them should be relatively universal. Uh, I don't know if this all makes sense. What hierarchy are you referring to in files? Uh, well, the the file path, right? Uh, if you swap a file path, uh, you would have, uh, so for example, you had a path like home, uh, Marco, uh, Python, TensorFlow. That's one file path, right? Uh, you could have another file path uh, in which you have home, Marco, TensorFlow, Python, or from whatever, it really doesn't matter, right? Uh, or now, what I'm saying is that uh, this this is hierarchical in that home is higher in the hierarchy than user, uh, and user is higher in, in the hierarchy than TensorFlow, and so on and so forth. This is the same for packages, but for packages, or at least if we follow the Perl uh, spec, uh, each individual namespace, each individual slice, it has a name, has a prop. It, it's a named property. Uh, what I'm arguing is that in a file path, you this these namespaces are unnamed. They are 
they're not specific to uh, to a particular like specification of anything. We could we could lean on like systemd or xdg or any of those sorts to try to come up with a with a way to to give properties to file paths. But I don't know if that is universal. That would be like very platform specific. Uh, now, essentially, what I'm uh, let me go to the to the Jamboard. Uh, so. So I have a question, and then feel free to ignore this until we, um, Lila. Um, I think the issue with the hierarchy is that it has explicit context, which it's not encodable, right? It's kind of like you have the hierarchy of home to use a tensor for Python, but it belongs to Brandon's machine. <laughs> Home user Python but uh, tensor of Python versus Santiago's machine home user tensor of Python and so what you have is like a part of a hierarchy that belongs to some other hierarchy which is unknown. Right. Uh, sorry, Marco. Um, yeah, I, I think that the fact that this is an unnamed, undefined hierarchy um, where individual components can't really be referred to. Or picked out to, unlike with packages. Um, I think that limits it, its use. Um, so maybe it's something that we don't need to support. Maybe that's a question. Do we need to support um, picking out like sections of this for files or an unnamed hierarchy? So at least when we were thinking about it, I think there was one use case which just was like file names. I think that was it. Uh, as a heuristic to detect if certain things were present. Um, so I think file names and existence of certain file hashes were the only two things. Now there could be a world where like maybe in the 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 data sets world where a file has a a file is a package, right? In the sense of like I'm distributing this file as a data set, I'm using it the same way I'm distributing a piece of code. I think that would be somewhat different, but I, I, I don't see that as a power path, right? I see that as like a fully qualified URI with like S3 slash something, slash something. So I am... Going back to that, I what I wonder is if we want to essentially treat each individual phenomena as some sort of a like I don't know if you recall the conversation about like hard properties and soft properties, for example, hash. Uh, Inherent. Can, in... Yeah. It's... Can we? Yeah. Can we like very specifically specify how are we exploding each identifier into a collection of properties uh, that then we use for like a set based lookups? Uh, and this both works in ingestion and in querying, I guess. Uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't know if this makes sense. Essentially, we 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 could say, hey, here's the. It's almost like a meta pearl sense, in a sense. We, this is a way to tell me which type of identifier you're talking about. Like, for example, are you talking about the data set file uh, on a remote location? Something like data set plus HTTPS colon slash slash. And then we have a dispatcher, essentially like the handler for that, that explodes the identifier into a series of like consistent properties. We could do something like Linux plus, sorry, file plus Linux systemd or something like that, where we say, hey, this all falls within 
a series of like very defined expectations on how uh, file system stuff needs to be uh, uh, needs to be done for like base operating system files. Uh, and I would assume that we wouldn't have like a crazy uh, gigantic sort of a dictionary of things that can be done or like ways that we can analyze these different types of identifiers. But I, uh, I also imagine uh, this would at least uh, simplify how we think about individual edge cases and would also let us uh, like be very transparent as to how do we handle things. Uh, when when we're dealing with like for example what you have right now like you, you have an s3 bucket uh this is how we're going to reason through it we know that an s3 bucket has this uh this element in a hierarchy right it, it needs to be a location uh like a remote location it needs to be i forget if they're like a if they're anonymous but like a, there there's a, a key id or a value right and then we can probably uh add a hash or something like that uh, at a hash or something like that, just to just to to give an example. I don't know if I'm making sense. I mean, I think that makes sense to me. Um, I think if I if I understand what you're saying as well. What you're saying is that if there isn't any important identification, then we don't actually have to create any labels. And... Yeah, I, I think that's kind of it. Mm. Yeah. We would still have the problem of the the sort of like identifier uh, ambiguity, but I think that's something that we tackle separately as well. I guess the question is if I if let's say they give us the information about a file without any context of where it's hosted, right? Let, let's say I give you, oh, let's, let's bring it back to the package flow. Let's say I give you a, a tarball and I tell you this is, a, this is an image, right? How are you going to construct, like, how do we encode that? So that is, that is what I was saying with a, with a whole, like a, ambiguity uh, meets like softening of edges uh, and like a soft and hard uh, identifiers, right? If you gave me a file, like here's a file path in my system, I can go and both look by the file path and see if I have something in there. Like if there's a file that's usually living in that place. So like slash OPT slash Zoom US slash client or something like that. Uh, but I could also just go and hash it and that is that is a very strongly tied uh, ID, if this makes sense. The other one is very loose, right? Anybody can put a file there. It could be like ambiguous in ways, but the latter one, I can I can use it as a tight binding. Uh, what I mean with this sort of like functions to to handle those is that I I could actually have those sort of like checks, right? You know, if somebody passes me a Perl that has a property that's the hash, then I can trust that property. Now, I don't know how we uh, how we do this structurally on the graph, uh, but that's something that we can definitely, uh, we can definitely give a priority to certain properties. Uh, on the last meeting we discussed of, of uh, essentially the matching for all and matching for none, I think that's probably good enough if the data is good. But uh, I would assume that we may want to have cases on matching for most or matching for strong and uh, hand with soft.
but I'm also noticing uh, we're four minutes away. Uh, I know that Soham wanted to also discuss his pull request really quickly. Uh, I don't know if we want to just do a quick uh, config switch. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, so uh, I have made all the changes as requested um, by Brandon. However, I just wanted to request some more feedback uh, as some of the changes may be conflicting with the ones that were requested by a previous reviewer. Do you want to share your screen and then talk about the ones that you, you have in question? Sure, just allow me to do It's, it's not a huge thing. It's just, um, one, one of them was if any of the three commands, which are the, the diff, the intersect and the union, should they be sub commands or should they just be flags? It's this one, so should they be sub commands or like I remember Jeff earlier um, did a review and he said this, this should be should be subcommands. Yeah, that's fine with me. Well, so subcommand is is you're you're talking about making separate Cobra commands, or you're just saying it's a positional argument instead of an optional argument? It, it's a positional argument. Yeah. So anything that's not optional shouldn't be an option, right? So things with a a dash in front of them are options. So anything that's required should just be a simply a positional argument that is um, listed out in the help. But they don't need to be subcommands. Like they don't need to be separate Cobra, Cobra commands unless that makes sense for you for the code to have separate like actual commands. You see, so these are not separate Cobra commands. Yeah. These are just, uh, positional arguments. So I think I can leave them as is. Yeah, so Brandon's asking if they should be subcommands, and if they're if they shouldn't, then that's okay. Yeah, yeah, I think that was my my yeah, the gist of what I was saying. Uh, and also this one. Um... Wait, wait, so so b before we 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 end on that, I think I think the question is like, should these be subcommands in the sense of doing, are we expecting different different set of flags for each of them in the future are they like separate enough um so i think they'll have the same set of flags but um should the user want to diff or union then it really depends on. so if it's like walk one analyze uh diff union or intersect and then they provide their response I think I'm thinking about it in terms of like the documentation for this also, right? Like, um, yeah, I, I feel like, a... yeah, sorry. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just thinking like in terms of now we have like maybe three different things. You want to add one more thing next time. I feel like sub commands do kind of like the same thing for us. Uh, and then they handle the documentation. Nicely as well. Yeah, so it's like how much overlap is the help text going to have? Like, is it going to have three paragraphs and says, if if you put diff, it's going to do this. If you put union, it's going to do this. Like, and also for the code, is it really three, you know, you know, a case statement with three totally separate pieces of code? Or is it really just one uh, kind of function that is... Um, with with this actually being truly, uh, you know, just a small difference. And and yeah, I think I think if you have the help of function, you could add this as like the, um, the option, data on the spell. Um, but yeah, to just find I think like, if this ends up being like a huge explanation block on what the three different things are, then. Maybe it's worth splitting out. So should I just leave it as is for now?
So I think both Jeff and I suggested to use our commands. Okay. Um, so I think unless you think there's a reason why we shouldn't use sub commands, I think. And so I didn't suggest use sub commands. I think this oh. is a not an correct interpretation. I suggested use positional arguments, which is what it was changed to. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think it's a good question. Is it should it be a sub command? Uh, I don't know the answer here. Should, um, should we move to the next question I have? Um, well, you, you're looking for a resolution on the, the this this comment, right? Um, I am saying this in cell, uh, kind of over time. Yeah, that's true. Um, why don't maybe you can set up a meeting with whoever reviewed this and then that's that's we can help hash it out since there are some conflicting um commands all right yeah that sounds good yeah yeah i maybe write up the 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 particular ones that you think that they are conflicting commands and then maybe put a uh add something to the uh slack channel and then either we can resolve it asynchronously or if we feel like we need a meeting to have a a more a higher bandwidth discussion we can we can schedule something with you all right that sounds good thank you so much cool. yeah i guess we're over time so all right thank you <laughs> thank thanks you. everyone see you later yeah. Bye.